I'm Lynn Smith, and welcome to the Bigfoot Project. The Blackberry Thicket Encounter, Merrimack County, New Hampshire. My mother owns 25 acres of dense woodland and watershed. There's only about two acres around the house that's reasonably flat and unforested. She's been there for about 20 years. The house sits about 100 feet back from the road and about 300 feet up from the pond, about center of the property. The area abounds with wildlife since the flood control reservation is just a short hop away. In addition, the town dump, a great resource of food for all the critters, is about five miles away to the southwest. After she'd been there a few years, she asked if I could till up an area for a small garden. I was employed at the time, so it was only after 6 p.m. that I could work on it. While doing it, I always had the feeling I was being watched from the direction of the setting sun. It made me so uncomfortable that I finally quit, only to work on it on weekend mornings when the sun was in the east and southeast. A few years later was my first encounter. It was late summer, early fall. The blackberries were just ripening. I was riding my ATV back in an area where I knew there was a massive blackberry thicket to do some collecting. The thicket was about three or four acres deep, deep in the outback. No one knew about it but me, I thought anyway. I figured it was cultivated at one time, but long forgotten since all the dwellings in the area had been abandoned once the government classified it a floodplain back in the 40s. I'd been there about 45 minutes to an hour, and I'd picked about all I could carry back. I mounted up and pulled out my canteen. I was taking my second mouthful when I suddenly smelled something like a garbage truck from the 1950s combined with raw sulfur, and I heard a rustle not far away from me and to my left. I looked forward to the noise, still with the canteen at my mouth. I saw a black shape about 20 to 30 yards away, moving so fast away from me, I couldn't believe it. At first I thought it was a bear, but almost immediately discounted that. More likely, I wanted it to be a bear. Nope, not likely a bear. It was on two feet, and it had a head and shoulders, and the gait was something like I'd seen somewhere before. That's about all the detail I could see. I started up my ATV, and I took off in the opposite direction as my big friend had gone, and just about as fast. Later on, I thought I should go back and look for and photograph footprints, but not alone. I decided to leave well enough alone. I figure he and I were collecting at opposite ends of the thicket, working towards each other and unaware we had company. He must have heard me opening my canteen. 1995 that summer, I had sold some selective timber off Mother's land, just to thin things out a bit. After the skitter had finished, I took my woodsy wagon, 76 Toyota four-wheel drive, and collected as much of the debris as I could, and stacked it in various clearings to burn when there was a snow cover. We had a horrendous winter that year. There was three to four feet of snow in the woods all winter long. I had to wait until early spring before the snow level was thin enough to walk back out there. The first pile was a quarter mile into the woods, it was about 60 degrees, and the snow was melting fast. I knew I'd only be able to do one brush pile. I was about 100 feet or so from pile number one. I saw a set of tracks coming from the south, up to the pile, walking around the pile, and then proceeding on towards the north, across the pond, in full view of the back of the house. Although the tracks were only a week or so old, with the warm weather, they'd be gone by the next day. It was so warm that day that there was no detail left to see except that the stride was about twice mine. I pondered whether to go back to the house and get my camera or just burn the pile and forget about it. I went back and got my camera and a yardstick. While I was photographing, my friend Bob walked up behind me and I nearly jumped out of my skin. I completely forgot and he offered to help with the burn. We followed the tracks up to the edge of the pond and we could see where the animal had walked out to where he could get a full view of the house and stood there. He then proceeded off at a bit of an angle towards the west and off into the woods. All in all, the trail we had a clear view of was over a quarter of a mile long. No telling where it began or where it ended. Bob insisted it was a moose. I pointed out that this animal had only two legs. He said that sometimes moose walk in their own footprints. He was unconvinced, and that was okay. He's a hunter, and I wouldn't want my big friend to get shot at, so I dropped the issue. April 2005 my mother Helen, 93 and a half years of age, and she's pretty much self-sufficient and still lives by herself. Physically, she's in good shape, but her mind does occasionally wander, so I visit every day from 12.30 or so until she goes to bed, around 7 p.m. 
One day, about 8.30 p.m., she called me at home to tell me there was a black man on her deck trying to get the bird feeder down. I was able to calm her down by convincing her it was probably just a raccoon or something. When I went over the next day, I realized there was, in fact, a visitor, but that it was no raccoon. I bought that particular bird feeder because it was advertised as squirrel-proof. It was made almost entirely of heavy-gauge steel and an eighth-inch diameter wire with a tight-fitting screw-on cover. Mother insists I fill it with shelled sunflower seeds. It attached to a six-foot-long vertical steel pole with a four-foot steel cantilever arm extending to a right angle to the pole. The pole base is mounted on the deck rail, which is about 40 inches above the deck surface. The deck itself is about seven feet above the ground level. All told, the actual feeder hangs out over the deck by four feet and is about 12 feet above the ground level. I designed it that way so as to be bear-proof. When I checked it out that morning, I found the vertical pole to have been bent slightly outward and the line suspending the feeder snapped off. The feeder was on the ground just about directly under the now empty hanger with the top off, empty of seed. I didn't want to alarm my mother with my suspicions, and it was unlikely she remembered back to the night before anyway, so I didn't ask for any details about the black man. We've had bear problems here in the past, but this was not the way a New Hampshire black bear operates. Here's why I don't think it was a bear. A bear would have had major difficulty even reaching the feeder. New Hampshire black bears can stand on their hind legs for only a short time, and the reach is only six to seven feet for an adult male. Even if he did find some magic way to grab onto the feeder and break the string, he would have dragged it off into the safety of the woods to try to get at the seed. If he had decided not to take it away with him, he would have bit it until he crushed it. I have saved a feeder from two years ago, and that's exactly the way it opened. This one was unscrewed. The cover is very tight-fitting, and the only way to get it open is if you happen to be equipped with an opposable thumb. This time the feeder was not damaged in any way, not even a scratch on the paint. I figured something was up, so last fall I restrung the feeder with a thousand-pound test nylon rope. It would just barely fit in through the pulleys. I refilled it all winter long and enjoyed watching the freebies and goldfinches through sun, snow, and freezing rain for six months. Today I found the post and arm, feeder, and the deck rail on the ground below with the rope still intact. The feeder top was unscrewed again, and the feeder was, of course, empty. David Lee, Salisbury, New Hampshire Ossipee Range, Carroll County, New Hampshire My friend Peter Samuelson of Freiburg, Maine, has been prospecting in these mountains for more than 40 years. He had honestly told me the story of what he and his friend Holly saw that day in the mountains, and an interpretation of the events should be left up to the reader. Even Samuelson himself is unsure at all what exactly happened. It was midsummer, 1979. Samuelson, his dog Cat, and his girlfriend Holly Swafield were out prospecting in the Ossipi Range. We drove in the Gillum Valley Road, parked at the gate, and continued up the old road past the Tamworth Ossipi town line, he said. Then we cut into the woods on the right and headed west of Bald Mountain. The ledgy Bald Mountain is taller than Mount Whittier and is located just south of it. From its open ledges, you can look directly below to Connor Pond, located in the center of the range. We bushwhacked in two miles up to the ledges on Bald, Samuelson said. The area contained a lot of Conway granite, and we were looking for contact zones, edges where two types of rocks meet. Along these zones, it's possible to dig for pockets of barrels or topaz crystals. As the trees opened up before them and Connor Pond became visible far below to their left, they saw a strange sight about a hundred yards ahead on the ledges. It was a small structure, yet made of big stones, stacked on each other, he said. The roof was flat and made of thatched hemlock boughs. There was an opening like a rustic doorway, and we saw a giant man-like creature inside, about seven feet high, and his back to us. It was totally covered with tangled gray hair about three inches long. In the same instant that this all became visible to them, Cat began growling intensely, and the creature started to make loud noises, indicating it was upset. I can't describe the noise, said Samuelson. Anyway, Holly freaked, and we all felt threatened. We hightailed it out of there immediately, in the direction we had come. Only later, partway down the mountain, did we pause and ask ourselves, what did we see? 
They had both carried cameras, but in the urgency to leave, never thought to take a picture. Over the next few days, they told various acquaintances of their experience. Asked how these people reacted, Samuelson said with a smile, You know how. A few months later, Holly excitedly called him and said she had been at the Wolfboro Library and found a fascinating story. During a midwinter thaw in the 1890s, a person in a cabin on the shore of Connor Pond, located in the center of the Ossipi Range, saw an alarming thing. A dog had wandered out on the thawing pond. It fell through the ice and was floundering vainly for a long time to get out. Suddenly, a large, hairy, human-like creature came out of the woods from the direction of Bald Mountain, reached out with long arms, and rescued the dog, then immediately disappeared back in the woods from the direction it first appeared. That old story added some continuity to their own experience, no matter how unbelievable. Still, it took Samuelson a year to get his courage and curiosity up enough to return alone to the site of their mysterious and alarming encounter on Bald Mountain. As he walked out onto the ledges, he was struck again, this time because there was absolutely no sign of the structure that they had seen the year before. He picked around the area thoroughly, looking for the slightest dent in the ledges where the big stones might have rested stones that would normally take two or three people to move. There was nothing. Ed Parsons, Mount Washington Valley. Bearbrook State Park, Merrimack County, New Hampshire. It was around 1983 or 1984, and we were just south of Concord, New Hampshire, and there's a huge state park there called Bearbrook State Park. It covers many acres with just one road cutting through it, and there's no houses except for a few on the edge of the forest at either end. I was a passenger in a vehicle cutting through this gigantic forest at about 2 o'clock in the morning. We saw something walk across the road about 15 feet in front of the car, and it continued walking into the woods. At the time, I didn't even know about Bigfoot. We were coming home using a shortcut from visiting friends. I wondered... What is somebody doing out here, alone, dressed up like a gorilla at this hour, in the middle of the woods where no one can see him? And where is he going, with no home or vehicle around for miles? But this was no man. I never talked about this sighting to anyone except my husband. This thing was a male, about seven to eight feet tall. I saw the huge chest. It had less hair than the rest of the body, as he passed in front of the car, and I asked, Are the high beams on? This thing just crashed through the bushes off the side of the road like nothing. Then he stopped briefly and looked and turned back at me before moving deeper into the woods like he'd gone this way before. In the dark woods, I don't recall seeing details of the face, as he was already about 20 feet away. But in the road, I had seen him sideways, and I remember the chest as he turned. I remember thinking that this guy is wearing a head-to-toe Halloween costume. He took large strides and moved rather quickly, not appearing to be confused or lost at all. And the way he moved was like the creature in that video. He turned his shoulders with the head, not turning a neck the way a human does. His big head was rounded and covered with long, dark hair. His shoulders were rounded and his build was stocky. He must have weighed at least 300 pounds, and he was covered in long black hair about three inches in length. I remember thinking that he did not walk the way a man does, as he was hunched a little forward as he moved. I remember wondering initially who this man was trying to impress because he has no audience, and it was pitch black out there with no streetlights at all. Now I'm thinking that these creatures must have superb night vision. The driver was going slowly on this curvy, sometimes hilly road, but he never stopped the car. I observed all this quite quickly, and then the thing was gone. I was never frightened, just overwhelmed with curiosity. I thought it was very strange and puzzling. It made no sense to me at the time. But now I'm convinced that I saw the same thing others have described. It's now been 25 years, and I've never written about this experience before. Thank you, and God bless. Sincerely, Angela. Thanks for joining me on the Bigfoot Project. If you have a story you would like to share here, you can email me, Lynn Smith, at thebigfootproject at mail.com. I'm looking forward to hearing from you.